And I remember one particular trip that uh, he made following Senator Goodell, who came to Los Angeles, a series of meetings that I had set up, including an address to the Los Angeles County Bar Association, one of the great speeches I've ever heard. And he came, and Gloria Steinem came. Those were the two reporters. <laughs> That's pretty, pretty heavy stuff. Anyway, we, we had a wonderful time. And it happened that that night he met someone that he later married, a very great woman by the name of Catherine O'Neill. So we've been friends a long time. I treasure the friendship. I love him dearly. He is the very best that the Fourth Estate has to offer, and he has become one of our <coughs> most eminent historians. And those who sit under his teaching at USC, at the Annenberg School of Journalism, are lucky and fortunate in ways they do not understand. Welcome, please, the great Richard Reeves. Hi, I'll, I'll pick up where he left off about his baseball career. No, about a, a point that I would make at the beginning uh, of what I'm going to talk about. That is, it is not a story about Japanese or even about Japanese Americans. It's a story about Americans on both sides of the barbed wire of the camps spread across the high deserts and swamps uh, of America. Uh, George mentioned Alan Simpson, uh, who became uh, a three-time term, three-term United States Senator in Wyoming. Uh, one of the camps, one of the concentration camps, as they were called by, quite correctly, uh, by by President Roosevelt was at a place called Heart Mountain in Wyoming. Uh, all of these places were places where no one had ever lived and still no one ever lived. They were the most barren, unpleasant uh, places in the country. The uh, people who came from San Diego ended up in camps where the, uh, the summer temperature reached 120 and the winter temperature reached 30 below zeros as they lived in tar paper shacks without, uh, without heat or cooking uh, or uh, sanitation. At any rate, there was a, uh, when I say it's an American story, there was a scoutmaster in Cody, Wyoming. Uh, the Japanese Americans to the extent they could, uh, really created small town Americas in these camps uh, behind uh, barbed wire. And a Manzanar in Cali here in California had more than 180 baseball leagues. Uh, Boy Scouts raised the flags and lowered them, the American flags, uh, every morning and night uh, in the camps. A scoutmaster in Cody, Wyoming, uh, thought, he was a very rare man, thought it would be a good idea to bring his troop to Heart Mountain where, to meet with the Boy Scout troops within the camps uh, and to hold what scouts call a camporee. So that they set it up and we in pup tents, and if people don't know how small uh, pup tents are, and there would be one American kid from Wyoming and one Japanese American kid, usually from California, uh, and they would share a tent for three days. Uh, Alan Simpson was a member of that Boy Scout troop, and he was put in a pup tent introduced to uh, his counterpart, whose name was Norm Mineta, uh, later the mayor of San Jose, a uh, U.S. congressman and, tw and member of two, uh, two cabinets. Uh, that's what I mean by an American story. However people 
acted or reacted, uh, they were Americans. Uh, and uh, so let me begin by, I just want to give a short version of, uh, which many of you may know, about what went on here. The, and it was, when I say it's an American story, we have to live with the fact, uh, we should live with the fact, we should know the fact, that the, much of the immigration into this country, if not almost all of it, had to do with times where we needed labor. And how did we treat these people? Well, leaving aside slavery and Native Americans, uh, the Chinese came to build the railroads, uh, the uh, Eastern Europeans came uh, for the steel mills and the slaughterhouses, Northern Europeans came uh, to farm the upper Midwest, uh, and Jews, Irish need not apply. The fact is that all of these groups came here, all of them were discriminated against and worse, uh, and we would not accept them because they were not like us until they were us. Uh, and we are the descendants of, of all of those, all of those people. And one of the darker chapters uh, was the feelings about Japanese Americans in this country. Our immigration laws, going back to 1790, specified that only white people could become Americans. Uh, that extended through several immigration acts and the Oriental Exclusion Act of 1924 uh, stated that Japanese Americans could not become citizens of the United States uh, and on between 1924 and until the act was amended in 1952. Uh, the, uh, so that the, when we talk about the Issei, which I will, with first generation Japanese, they could not become citizens. Uh, no matter what they did. The same was true of Chinese most of that time. The, uh, but their children, the Nisei, the second generation, did become, yeah, they were born in America, and they became American citizens. On, uh, on December 7th, uh, 1941, as we all know, uh, the Imperial Japanese Navy attacked Pearl Harbor and killed uh, 2,400 people there. Uh, before sundown on December 8th, the FBI had rounded up uh, more than 4,000 uh, Japanese Americans in California, Oregon, and Washington. Uh, they were all on lists. The lists were a bit of a joke uh, because they really were like Rotary Club luncheons. That is, anyone uh, who was, had any influence in the Japanese American community, teachers, journalists, businessmen, uh, priests, uh, were on these lists for no other reason uh, than their prominence. And they were the ones rounded up and sent to federal prisons or facilities around the country. Often, they were, their houses were searched, everything was turned around in 24 hours, they were taken away, their families often didn't know for as long as a year where they were or whether they were still uh, alive. Uh, it, and then for two weeks after December 7th, particularly in here, people in the east, there were very few Japanese Americans uh, east of the Sierras and the, the Cascades, uh, didn't really know what was uh, what was happening here, but the, the end of what was happening here was a kind of tsunami of hysteria, of fear. It was a real fear. The Japanese, after all, had, had bombed Pearl Harbor. Uh, of racism, which was total and open uh, in uh, this part of the country and every place else, and greed. The Japanese Americans had become prosperous in, on the West Coast. 40% uh, of the agricultural product 
of California was produced on Japanese American farms. Uh, fishermen in all up and down the coast, uh, merchants of various, uh, various kinds, and there were people, often their neighbors, who wanted their land, wanted their houses, wanted their possessions, and in general got them. Uh, the, uh, so that uh, it was, to give you an example of what, uh, what went on, uh, a man named Yasui in uh, Hood River, Oregon, uh, was questioned by the FBI. He was a civic leader to the point that his son was a lieutenant in the United States Army and a lawyer practicing in California. All of the Japanese Americans were discharged from the Army on December 8th. Uh, and Yasui yeah, was visited by the FBI, broke into his home, searched everything there, and finally found George crude drawings showing where the Panama Canal was. And they asked him, so what is this? Why are you? He said, well, if you look at it, you can see that's my children's schoolwork. They've been studying the Panama Canal. Well, that may have been his children's uh, schoolwork, and it was, uh, but he was uh, taken away to Missoula, Montana, uh, and kept there uh, for most of the duration of the war because of something his children had, had drawn. The, uh, the, the very nice, favorable uh, review of this book in the Los Angeles Times said it had the most distinguished set of villains since Antigone. <laughs> and then it said, continued on page 14. Well, like, I thought maybe they're going to compare me to Sophocles. I mean, you know, <laughs> but no, they just let it go. They let it go at that. But I want to tell you who the villains were. Uh, the first was Franklin Roosevelt. Franklin Roosevelt obviously is a great man uh, we, who did great things for this country and for the world. But he was also a man of his time. He was a racist. Uh, he believed in eugenics. And if you look into the archives of the White House, you find out that he had conversations uh, with his uh, people and with the military and, and posited uh, the theory that the reason the Japanese, Imperial Japanese, uh, were so aggressive was because of the shape of their skulls. And he thought that procedures could be worked out to change their skulls enough that within 2,000 years they could reach the level of civilization of Caucasians. Uh, we know it didn't take, uh, anyway. Uh, the, uh, the principal uh, villain here uh, was the Attorney General of California, a man named Earl Warren, uh, who literally rode the backs of the Japanese to Japanese Americans uh, to the governorship of California, and as we know, to, the, to become Chief Justice of the United States. Uh, Warren was the one who came up, uh, General John DeWitt, who was the commander of the 4th Army, which was the army on the West Coast headquartered at the Presidio in uh, San Francisco, came up, with, uh, uh, came up with the theory or the statement that all Japs looked alike. There was no way to tell them apart. Therefore, we had to round them all up because there was no way to know whether they were loyal or not. Uh, Earl Warren uh, came up with the theory. The, these people were in Washington talking to the Congress, talking to the press. It was Earl Warren who came up with the theory that because there had never been a single act of Japanese American sabotage, either in Hawaii or on the mainland, uh, that that was absolute proof that there was a secret fifth column and that they would be uh, they were holding back for one big strike. A cartoonist in New York, taking up Earl Warren's line, uh, did a wonderful cartoon, which is in this book, of buck, uh, buck teeth, air, uh, eyeglass, 
uh, Japanese Americans coming all the way down the coast and picking up dynamite in California while they stood with telescopes uh, and the headline was waiting for the signal from Tokyo. His name was uh, uh, Geisel. I mean, we know better as Dr. Seuss. Uh, the same time, Edward R. Murrow uh, was traveling through his native start, state of Washington saying that when the Japanese came to kill us, uh, as they surely would, uh, the, uh, when you see the men, the pilots in those planes, they will be wearing University of Washington sweatshirts uh, and University of Washington State uh, graduation rings. Uh, Warren's influence uh, spread to, uh, he was the leading spokesman uh, on the West Coast. Walter Lippmann, then the, uh, the most influential columnist and public intellectual in the United States, came out here and spent a day with, uh, with Earl Warren, where Warren had these elaborate maps showing where the Japanese lived uh, under power lines, near factories, uh, near military bases, without mentioning the fact that they were there before these bases and, and wires came through. Uh, and Lippmann went back to Washington uh, and wrote two columns saying uh, that there was a fifth column on the West Coast that were going to strike uh, and try to disable the country. That was February 17th, 1942, the day he got back. On February 19th, two days later, now having the cover, really, of the liberal press, to say nothing of the illiberal press of the West Coast, which was running stories about how little brown men were being trained to rape white women. That was on the front page of the Los Angeles Times. Uh, the uh, Two days after he got that cover from Lipman, Franklin Roosevelt signed Executive Order 9066. What 9066 said was that the military had the, uh, in time of war, the military had the power to uh, create uh, military zones uh, and then had the power to remove anybody in those zones who was a potential uh, enemy of the United States. Uh, well, the only people they removed were Japanese Americans. They couldn't remove German Americans. They couldn't remove Italian Americans. There were memos back and forth about what a public relations disaster it would be if they arrested uh, Joe DiMaggio's parents uh, who lived in San Francisco and were enemy evidence, as was, uh, as were the parents of Angelo Rossi, the mayor of San Francisco, Fiorello LaGuardia, the mayor of New York. Uh, they were, uh, they would, the Japanese Americans then were the only ones removed, two-thirds of them American citizens. If the same one drop of blood standard, which is what the standard was, uh, had been applied to Germans and Italians, we would have had to put 50 million people in concentration camps. So that wasn't practical, nor was it practi practical to put the Hawaiian Japanese Americans uh, because they were 47% of the economy of Hawaii, which would collapse if they had been rounded up. But largely for uh, political reasons and uh, and really the greed, uh, the Japanese Americans were the low-hanging fruit. And they were uh, interesting uh, people in many ways. They, there was no resistance whatever uh, to what was done. The Japanese Americans who were called to go to assembly places around the state of California, Oregon, and Washington went willingly. They were. They could carry, they could bring only what they could carry, two suitcases or a suitcase and a baby, uh, were put on sealed, uh, not, were put in trucks and taken to uh, what were called assembly centers. They felt, and I'll talk a little more about that, that this was their patriotic duty, that they loved America and they owed it to America to do whatever they wanted. 
That plus the fact that uh, the way the, pro the uh, incarceration program was, uh, uh, was characterized in the press and in government releases was that this was being done for the protection of the Japanese Americans. Uh, if they, even if they were 2,000 years behind us in development, when they got to the camps, they saw that the machine guns were pointed in, not out, uh, as were the tanks, uh, which surround some of the camps. They were taken first to what were called assembly centers. Almost all of those were racetracks uh, fairgrounds and livestock exhibition areas. The Japanese were put in stalls. Uh, each family would live in a stall uh, made for a horse. At Santa Anita, where 18,000 Japanese Americans were behind barbed wire while tar paper barrack shacks were being built out in the desert uh, for them. Uh, it, Turned out they all uh, said that they were in the stall of Seabiscuit. Uh, but that was, uh, but again, there was no, uh, there was no resistance. Now, there were bad people and good people at all levels of this. Do people in this room know who Clara Breed was? Clara Breed uh, was the child's librarian, children's librarian of San Diego. Later, the, uh, uh, the librarian of this city. Uh, when she realized what was happening and that the Japanese Americans, many of the kids, had, had spent afternoons and weekends in her library, uh, she went to the trucks and the trains that were taking, and the camps, that were taking them away uh, and gave the kids that she knew postcards and asked them would they stay in touch with her as long as they were away. Not knowing really, I think, that they were going to be away for four years and perhaps forever. But I want to uh, read uh, a couple of things uh, about her. Uh, while they were home in San Diego, many young Japanese had been befriended and mentioned and mentored uh, by an extraordinary woman named Clara Breed, the children's library at that city's library main branch. Dozens of young Nisei, second generation, born in the United States, citizens, came to the building to study and read after school. Miss Breed, appalled at the mass roundups, went to the trains and buses leaving town, leaving town and gave her children, as she called them, small gifts and more important, her address, postcards, envelopes, and stamps. Their letters uh, were collected, she saved them all, and they provide a unique view of what the evacuation was really like, what the assembly centers were like, and then what the camps were like. Catherine Tasaki, a 10-year-old from San Diego, was one of the dozens of children from that city who corresponded throughout the war with Clara Breed. In her first card from Santa Anita, Catherine was as cheerful as she was young. I'm having a good time. Lots of my relatives live here, and we can see Miss Mount Wilson from here. The grandstand was made into a, caf a cafeteria. Uh, there's a playground for children. Uh, that's when you're 10. 17-year-old uh, named Louisa Gawa, uh, who had been a, a, a junior at San Diego High School. You understand that on December 8th, all of the Japanese American children in this city were taken away from the schools. Uh, uh, had been a junior in San Diego High, and she was one of Miss Breed's most faithful correspondents. Uh, Dear Miss Breed, January 6, 1942, I, re I received the sweater and my brother's shorts. Thank you very much for going through so much trouble for me. I was very glad to hear you like the flowers. I wish I could have uh, sent uh, two dozen roses, American roses, 
American Beauty Roses, uh, to show my appreciation for everything you've done for me. In my last letter, I said the fence was torn down. Well, it's up again, this time a few feet further out. We have been told that the reason for the fence building was so the cattle wouldn't come near our homes. Uh, but as yet, we have not seen any cattle. Uh, I think that the fence tends to weaken the morale of the people. Two months later, uh, Louise writes, I just received two intensely interesting <coughs> books which you so kindly sent. Uh, this is my third week at Santa Anita. It's a beautiful place. I visited Seabiscuit's statue and have gone around the racetrack several times. I'm sleeping where Seabiscuit used to sleep, is a common saying here. I heard we're going to have a library soon. Uh, if, uh, but, uh, bitter feelings do not enter my head. If I am helping the government by staying here, I am glad. I want so much to be some help for my government. Uh, and that was pretty much a universal uh, feeling at the beginning of this, that Japanese uh, did not resist. They went to the assembly points with only what they could carry. They were, numbers were put around their neck and they were taken on buses or sealed trains uh, to uh, uh, to the camps, the assembly centers in the camps. Clara Breen, when she went to visit Santa Anita, she wasn't allowed in, but she said she did overhear uh, a young Japanese American girl say to her mother, uh, Mother, I am tired of Japan. Let's go back to the United States. Uh, on Wednesday, this is from Fusa Sumagari, again from San Diego. On Wednesday, the army entered ordered our barracks searched. Previous to this, whenever such an order was given, we were notified of everything. This, however, was done abruptly with no reason given. Then they closed certain gates and would not allow people to pass unless they were searched. To top that, they began to confiscate scissors and knitting needles. Some of the police had the nerve to steal people's money and remove things from people's houses Without allowing, the, without allowing the occupants to see what was being taken. Uh, one policeman in particular aroused the people to such a degree that they began to mob him. Unfortunately, the mob of people were so aroused, they chased him and beat him with chairs. Uh, the army took control of Santa Anita then for three days. Uh, the, uh, again, this is a letter from Louisa Gawa. Uh, she's now been incarcerated uh, for five months. Uh, and she wrote to Clara Breed, uh, I may have complained about my new environment, but I know it will be difficult to, adopt my, to adapt myself to the new surroundings right away. I'm sure everything will brighten up soon and I will begin to love this place almost as much as my home in San Diego. When I stop to think how the pilgrims started their lives, similar to ours, it makes me feel grand. It gives me the feeling of being a pure, full-blooded American. <laughs> they, I will... Uh, uh, I just got a kick out of this particular one, which was from Fusa uh, Sumagari, who met a boy in the camps. The young people were given, it was kind of a Mickey Rooney, Judy Garland world. These were American kids, they didn't know, never been to Japan, uh, couldn't speak Japanese, wore bobby socks, listened to the same music as every other American kid, but they had lived in very tight families. And that was broken uh, by the camps, partly because of mess hall dining. Uh, that is, that the kids could run wild and didn't have to eat with their parents. They could go, there was around the clock feeding. Some of it, K rations left over from World War I. Uh, and uh, Fusa writes pretty excitedly to Clara uh, back here. Uh, the, 
I, I was needless to say more than surprised and all agog when I saw him again. He's the fellow I went around with at Santa Anita. By then she was in the camps. But it wasn't really serious. But now that I've seen him again and realized he came all the way from Utah, I feel like that song, it, it started, quote, it started all over again. The moment I looked into his eyes, etc. It seems to me, I've got it bad and that ain't good. He's about five foot eight, dark, got a nice shaped head, looks like Ronald Reagan in a crude kind of way. Uh, so that was uh, the kids uh, from this town uh, coming back. They were, there were 10 after the assembly centers and the living in stalls, and many people telling me that they will never forget the smell of horse urine, which they lived in. Also, a thousand of them died in uh, the assembly camps from natural causes, uh, typhus, uh, cholera. Uh, there were 10 camps uh, around the country, all, as I said, in barren places where people had never lived, like the now barren Owens Valley, Tule Lake, California, uh, Poston, Arizona, which was uh, an old Indian reservation, and two swamp camps in, uh, in Arkansas. Uh, they were, they lived, the camps were designed uh, for prisoners of war. Uh, they were tar paper shacks, uh, barracks, with four or five apartments in them. No running water, no cooking facilities, uh, and one electric light uh, per barrack. Uh, the, these are in areas where the temperatures, I, I may be repeating myself, range from 120 in the summer to 30 below in the winter. One of the people who was kept in post in Arizona, roast and toast and post them, as it was known uh, by the kids, uh, the men would dig foxholes under the barracks and leave their younger children in there all day because that was the coolest spot uh, that you could find uh, in the camps. Uh, I am going to, I, I can go on forever, believe me. Uh, the, very early on, the government realized that it had made a mistake. The first director of the War Relocation Authority, Milton Eisenhower, Dwight Eisenhower's brother, later the president of Penn State, lasted only a month because he couldn't sleep and he couldn't eat uh, by what he was being asked uh, to do. But they found others, mostly prison guards and uh, administrators on Indian reservations, uh, who would take uh, those jobs. Uh, by 1943, the government had realized that, that this was a disaster, and also the war was lasting longer uh, than people had originally uh, thought it would do. Uh, and so that they began to once again draft Japanese American boys. The difference between being incarcerated in a camp under machine guns, uh, under searchlights, uh, under uh, guard towers. If the latrines were outdoors, they were nothing but a board with a hole every foot long. Women and girls especially would often, uh, would often wait until late at night to go to the latrine so that they could have some privacy. Uh, one of them, Fusa, young lady I mentioned, ran out one night to do that, and she was picked up by a searchlight, which followed her all around, terrified her. Terrified 17, terrified mm -hmm. her. Uh, and she ran and dived under the barracks. On the other hand, at another camp, uh, an eight-year-old boy who did the same thing went out, and when the spotlight came on him, he thought, George Takai. <laughs> the, uh, so uh, the, when the, young, the difference between the incarcerated mainlanders and the unincarcerated uh, 
Hawaiians was shown when the Army began to draft and to try to enlist Japanese soldiers as the war went on. The initial attempt in the camps, there were 120,000 people in the camps, only 1,200 of the uh, young men uh, volunteered. Most of them saying, I would be glad to serve, I want to serve, uh, if my uh, family is given their civil rights. In Hawaii, where there was no incarceration, uh, when it was announced they could go into the Army, 20,000 young men descended on the recruiting center in Honolulu, uh, which could only take uh, 3,000 of them at first. Among the people rejected was Daniel Inoue, who was a medical student. Uh, he was told he wouldn't take medical students uh, because they were needed at home. He quit medical school and on the second wave was accepted uh, in the U.S. Army. They were put in Camp Shelby, Mississippi, the 442nd Regimental Combat Team. Uh, Japanese Americans from the mainland and from Hawaii. Uh, and the 442nd and the 100th Battalion, which was attached to it, uh, were, became the most decorated unit in American military history. Uh, they won, there were 30,000 Japanese Americans served in Europe, 18,000 of them were the casualties. They won 18 medals of honor, including one for Daniel, Lieutenant Daniel Inouye, who lost an arm and won the medal in Italy. Uh, the, uh, they were incredibly brave, but I want to tell two stories about how we dealt with them. The 442nd became famous by rescuing the Lost Battalion, which was a, a unit from the National Guard in Texas, surrounded by Germans. Uh, they rescued them after a very, very uh, bitter fight with heavy casualties and brought them down off that mountain where newsmen, the story had become famous, the Lost Battalion, it's like a movie. Uh, and the next, the New York Times reporting this on page one, this great adventure of the rescue, and said that the, lone, the Lost Battalion was rescued by fellow doughboys. The word Japanese American never appeared. The Japanese Americans, the 442nd, were the first American unit to reach Rome, uh, the first Axis capital that we, uh, we, we captured. They got there and the commander, General Mark Clark, uh, ordered them to stand in place for two days while they brought up enough white troops to march through Rome uh, in triumph while the Japanese were taken away uh, in trucks uh, outside, uh, outside Rome. Uh, when they, I'm going to, the 442nd in some parts of the country did kind of liberate Japanese Americans, but not always. The, uh, Dan Inouye, for instance, wearing his decorations, full uniform, lieutenant in the U.S. Army, went into a, a, a barber shop in San Francisco and was told, get your ass out of here, you chap. Uh, the, uh, beyond that, some whole areas made attempts to keep the Japanese from coming back to their own property, their own homes, not knowing that they had already lost them because their bank accounts had been frozen on December 8th, so they couldn't pay mortgages, they couldn't pay insurance. The houses uh, under regulations administrated by Earl Warren uh, were declared abandoned and distributed way below cost uh, among white people. The money loss of the Japanese Americans, a family in San Francisco, Seattle, who owned uh, a very successful, what we called in those days, an ice cream parlor, in which they had put in $28,000 worth of uh, refrigeration equipment and the other accoutrement. Uh, of an ice cream shop, uh, they were forced, 
they had six days to put their affairs in order before they uh, went to, to get on the bus at assembly points, had to sell it for $1,000. They also had a brand new 1940 Chevrolet, they had to sell that for $10. Uh, the, so these folks were destroyed. About two-thirds of them tried to come back to the West Coast uh, after they were released, but they also ran into things like Hood River, Oregon, one of the most beautiful spots on the planet. The Columbia River Gorge on one side, Mount Hood on the other. Uh, Mount Hood apples, Hood River apples, uh, were considered to be the best in the country. Their cherries, uh, most of them farmed uh, by Japanese Americans. Uh, on the uh, uh, the way of the world, uh, there, uh, when the Japanese Americans were rounded up uh, in Hood River, there were 271 Japanese living in Hood River. Uh, Oak Grave High School was the local high school, and that week the week of December 7, 1941, afterwards, uh, this poem, as an editorial, was published in the school newspaper. To those of Hood River, if you please, they are our friends, these Japanese, not Japs or even Japanese. They are Americans, our schoolmates, these. Three and a half years later, when the camps were empty, uh, and after the local American Legion post had taken, like every town in America, Hood River had an honor board of people serving abroad. And there came a night when the American Legionnaires went and painted, blacked out all the Japanese names, uh, 18 of them, uh, two of whom had already been killed in combat, uh, and painted over them on the honor board on the courthouse. And then when it came time for them to come back, the trees and the telephone poles and whatever around Hood River uh, held this, the same town where the kids said, these are our people. Statement to returning Japanese. Under the War Department's recent ruling, you will soon be permitted to return to this county, in caps, for your own best interests we urge you not to return. Uh, and the, they were armed, kind of vigilantes. Uh, the army had to bring in two generals to get the Japanese Americans back to their homes, most of which had been ransacked or burned uh, anyway. Uh, I want to lend, you know, if redemption is what we seek in, in religious life, and American life, uh, there is no doubt in my mind uh, that Earl Warren, for one, knew exactly what he had done. He was a religious man, uh, and uh, the in California, at Berkeley, they do these extensive oral histories of former governors. And uh, the point I'm going to make here is that there's no doubt in my mind that what he did and felt guilty about in 1942 led directly to Brown, to the Brown v. Topeka decision uh, in 1954. Uh, and when he was being interviewed for six days by a woman named Amelia Fry at Berkeley, finally on the sixth day, after going through all his accomplishments and honors, uh, she said, Mr. Chief Justice, uh, I want to ask you about the events of 1942. Earl Warren burst into tears, walked out, and never came back. So he knew. Uh, finally, the laws that made this possible, which were clearly unconstitutional, and as the Deputy Secretary of War, John McCloy, uh, said, I'm a Wall Street lawyer. The Constitution is just a piece of paper to me. Uh, all the law, though, though three cases involving Japanese American incarceration got to the Supreme Court, uh, two of them the court ruled against 
the plaintiffs in one, uh, a woman named Matsui. They ruled in her favor because she had been a state employee of California and had signed loyalty oaths, et cetera, et cetera. But they never discussed the real questions, uh, constitutional questions, that led to the incarceration. And there is no doubt, looking back and forth at the records of, say, William O. Douglas or Hugo Black, uh, that all these decisions were held off until after the 1944 election, because Roosevelt was afraid that if he lost the West Coast in that election, he would be defeated by Thomas E. Dewey. A week after he had won the election, he got up to make a fireside chat about what an outrage it was that the Japanese Americans were being held in concentration camps. Uh, but the main point I want to make is that there's, the laws are still on the books. They were never declared, nothing was ever declared unconstitutional. Robert Jackson, then a Supreme Court justice, said, this lies like a loaded gun on the Constitution. The fact is that they could round up the Muslims tomorrow, and the laws are, are all there. They could round up the border crossings and put them in concentration camps. The laws are all there, and they're exactly the same as they were in 1942 after Roosevelt signed Executive Order 9066. Thank you. Uh, six years old at Mary Jansen and Catalina, there was a village of Americans of Japanese ancestry. And we as kids went there to play. And they were so accepting of us. And then one day they were gone. And our mothers couldn't explain what had happened. Other than slavery, I think this is the worst chapter ever in our history. And I think the title of the book is absolutely correct, infamy. It's sobering, it's humbling, but if it causes to think about our country and our values, uh, that will be a good thing. I think Richard Reeves has done a very great service. And I ask you now to once again <coughs> let's express to him our appreciation. There are a thousand other things I tell you uh, from this book. I, there's one thing I forgot uh, to, uh, to mention. In addition to the 30,000 Japanese Americans who served in Europe, secretly, never known by the United States, in the United States, 6,000 Japanese Americans served in something called uh, the military intelligence uh, system, MIS. Uh, and what those men did, very few uh, Japanese Americans uh, were fluent or even capable of anything in Japanese, but people called the Kibei. The Kibei were Japanese born in America, but whose parents ed had them educated in Japan. They were often fluent in Japanese, and they formed the core of uh, the military intelligence service, which were trained by a man named uh, John Aiso, who became a, uh, a Superior Court judge in Los Angeles after, after the war. But what they did was interrogate, uh, <coughs> translate, and cave flush. Cave flushing was what happened because Imperial Japanese soldiers would not 
uh, surrender. They had been trained not to surrender, that it was more disgraceful, uh, death was a preferred alternative. And in places like Ujima and Okinawa, uh, they would take hostages from the local population and go into the caves. And the cave flushers, these Kibe, these American kids, uh, went in and talked them out uh, of killing themselves and killing the hostages. Often they would run into schoolmates inside the caves. They also, some of them swam to islands. They were unarmed. Uh, uh, to, and dozens of them were killed uh, by friendly fire because uh, American soldiers often thought that they were Japanese soldiers wearing American uniforms to the point that eventually two soldiers were, were assigned to, to guard each of the, uh, each of the M M MIS guys. And, and incredibly brave, incredibly brave people. Uh, and uh, Douglas MacArthur's chief of intelligence said that it was his opinion that the MIS shortened the war by two years and a million lives. They literally would uh, pretend to be Japanese officers in the dark, would shout orders, which would send the Jap Imperial Japanese into ambushes or in the wrong direction. They would crawl up the Japanese encampments and lie there all night listening to what the Japanese soldiers were being told, what their attack plan was for the next uh, for the next day, and then crawl back to to American lines so that we could prepare for what they found out was happening. Anyway, they were extraordinary people. Did you say they were cave cave flushers? Cave. After the cave flushers, cave. if anybody wants to know, came the flamethrowers. And of course, these guys went in there and told them, this is what's going to happen. 